once I decided I have to be this person that it's in, inhuman to be, but I think I have to be it. I made that an absolute goal. And at the point that it became an absolute is where my perfectionism was born. Now I had to be this no matter what in order to be okay. Anything right. less or other than that was not okay. And then I hated myself for it. Bill Wilson co-founder of Alcoholics Anonymous, wrote in 1952, if we examine every disturbance we have, great or small, we will find at the root some unhealthy dependence and its consequent demand. Wilson suggested that if we could identify and continually surrender these unrealistic and unrealizable demands, that we may then be able to accomplish what he imagined to be the recovery's next frontier, something he called emotional sobriety. Flash forward 70 years and join psychotherapists and best-selling authors Tom Rutledge and Dr. Alan Berger, who have taken up the mantle of exploring Bill Wilson's new frontier. Welcome to Emotional Sobriety. Welcome to Emotional Sobriety, the podcast. I'm Tom Rutledge, and with me is uh, Dr. Alan Berger. Thank God for emotional sobriety. We could start out with that today, you know. This is it's so relevant during this holiday season, and you know, and today we're going to talk about the perfectionism issue. But in the shows to come, we're going to talk about how this thing shows up in the holidays, too, man. Also with us is our wonderful producer, Patrick Newman. How are you doing, Patrick? Oh, I'm doing well. I'm uh, full of pie and the desire to clear away the wreckage of my past. So I'm happy to be here. <laughs> he said the wreckage now. of your past in terms of... of that's the now, are, are you ta- are you talking about records of your past of the last few days of the holiday yes. eating or <laughs> oh thankfully no thankfully no this is uh you know long gestating damage uh, okay this is this is the big stuff okay this year we decided that we were going to eat a turkey that we saw grow up down this road from us so we're out in farm country <laughs> <and> <laughs> Oh, and I- <laughs> there's this 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 farm down the road that does some amazing stuff. They're wonderful. It's a co-op. Ninety percent of the food grown in animals that are slaughtered there are given to food kitchens to feed the homeless. And in fact, on Wednesday and Thursdays, you can go volunteer for the whole day and go help out at the farm. They take any volunteers. Mm-hmm. So it's a really cool thing. So th- this year we decided we're going to support it. I haven't mm-hmm. been able to get over there to volunteer. That's on my list of things to do. But, um, you know, so we decided they raised these organic um, turkeys that mm-hmm. are grown out in the field. They eat grain and insects and they run wild. And free kill. range. Yeah. Free range turkeys, right? Well, a free range turkey is very different than a store bought, hormone <laughs> fed, you know, really? turkey. Oh, yeah. it's it's the first of all, the bird itself, because it's out inactive all the time, has a lot of muscle in it. Mm-hmm. It doesn't have that big white piece of breast meat that I've come to enjoy mm-hmm. over the years mm-hmm. from my butterball turkeys that I get mm-hmm. at the, you know, here. It's Giant Foods back in L.A. Yeah, it was yeah. mom or something like that. So it was a very, very, not, not saying it was bad. It was a different experience. The, the meat was delicious, by the way. I mean, mm-hmm. it was really very, very, very tasty, but it was a very, there wasn't like that big, big, big white breast to carve. There was a lot of, mm-hmm. you know, different kind of meat on this bird, which was, which was a different experience, different one. Before we move on from this, I, I need to be sure and go back and repeat my favorite part uh, so that it doesn't get lost in the conversation. And that is, Hey, this year we decided to do something different. Oh yeah. What was that? Alan, we decided to eat a Turkey that we knew personally. <laughs> <laughs> Um, grow up. I mean, every day we drive, we drive by past. I swear to God, every day we said, what is he setting up out there? He's talking to these little baby, these little baby turkeys. And we saw him grow up for the whole time. And then we decided to have one for, for Oh my God, I'm crying. I don't know that I'll be able to do the rest of this episode, but I'm going to try. Is- well, you know, one, one thing I did that I'm grateful for is the day after Thanksgiving, I went to an AA meeting out here in Maine. Belfast, mm. Maine. And was uh, that? it was good. And I, I think those are the meetings that I really get a lot out of is after the holiday and kind of 
after those that are participating have had a little, a few hours to settle in to whatever it was that happened, good or bad from the previous day. And uh, just, you know, it's, it's the, it's been so easy to get alienated uh, these last couple of years and uh, the frequency of my meeting attendance has gone way down. So I wanted to be sure while I was uh, out here that I got to, you know, feel for the local uh, recovery. We are in the holidays, so let's just do a little intro to, to the holidays here. First of all, to, to, for people listening, is that to me, the, the holidays are are a magnifying glass. It's like whatever whatever is good is absolutely wonderful. And whatever is not so good is can really suck, you know, worse than ever. Um, and for some people, there's reunions that are wonderful. And then other people, I, I call them, uh, you go back to your family for the brainwasher refresher course, you know, just in case you forgot how you got to be nuts. You go back and, and you see, you, you sit in some of the dysfunction and you deal with that stuff. And you, and you can have, I certainly did in my day was, was, uh, have the feeling that I'm losing some of my sanity when in fact I was just experiencing some of the insanity of my family. Um, but anyway, I want people to, to know that, you know, that, that things are, it's normal for it to be rough during this holiday. If it is rough, it's, if it's not, it's wonderful. Be grateful for that. But if it's, uh, but we, we always encourage you, even if it's a tough time to, to look for a way to be grateful for what you can learn from it and uh, reach out and get support. That's the most important message during this time of year. In the vaccination we would offer you, this will be your booster <laughs> shot, will be emotional <laughs> sobriety <laughs> 3 because it. it really does operate like that. But just like our booster shot, we're now finding there's another variant to this damn, you know, tenacious COVID virus, right? <laughs> and that they're talking about that the vaccination may not be that helpful with. But just like with emotional sobriety, there's going to be challenges that are going to come up for you that even though some of the tools you've been using up to this point won't work, it doesn't mean that if you hang in there and keep searching, you won't find some kind of a solution. And that's what we encourage you to do is just just don't give up when things get real tough. Hang in there and continue to be open to, you know, the discovering the solution because sometimes they come while you're sleeping at night. You're, you're going to go to sleep one night and you're going to sleep with a dilemma on your mind. You're going to wake up with a new perspective. Yeah. Yeah. And for some reason, and this is, I don't know if you, you tell me if this is y'all's experience. For some reason, what I've noticed through the years uh, is, is that people have a, a bit of a, people who tend to reach out for support as a normal part of their recovery tend to do that to be less likely to do that during the holidays. Uh, sometimes because the, the, the stuff is a little bit heavier, but sometimes, uh, sometimes I think it's because of, of our own codependence of, I don't want to disturb somebody else's holiday or whatever that is. So, so we just want to say that as we do the holidays, you know, whenever you're hesitating to reach out for support from somebody else, just turn it around and think, you know, how do you feel if somebody reaches out to you for support? And and just go ahead and assume that that person is is going to feel the same way. It's a good fee. It's a good feeling when somebody reaches to, reaches out for support. And you know, and sometimes we can feel it. It's, it's really easy to feel inadequate. I've always said it's easier to be a therapist than it is to be a, just a support person. You know, because a lot of times it's just, in those situations, it's like I'm, I'm I'm more likely to just kind of not know what to say and need just to be able to be there with somebody, which is even sometimes emotionally more difficult. It's like just to say, you know, you know. That really sucks what you're experiencing, uh, but I'm right here and you can check in with me again later if you need to, that kind of thing. So don't don't hesitate to reach for support. Obviously, that's that's my broken record for today. And our Thursday night emotional sobriety open 12 step mm -hmm. meeting will still be here and we'll be running through the holidays. And we had a nice turnout for people and we really talked about gratitude. And mm -hmm. so all of all of that, the the ID and password Patrick will list in the in the show notes for today as well as how to listen to the if the um other or how to watch the other um discussions we've had in that thursday night meeting because they're the last one on gratitude i thought was really really helpful to a lot of people tom we had a lot of parts oh i i love it and I, you know not surprising to me was it was a, a discussion on gratitude that wasn't there was no namby pamby in it there wasn't it just the, you know sometimes you can get into gratitude and it just kind of everybody get you know elevate and get out of the 
the the the reality of life and but it's not it's like it's the the real challenge of emotional sobriety is with gratitude is you know how do we how do we how do we work gratitude how do we feel gratitude how do we perceive what to be grateful for in the, in the midst of the of the messy world we live in you know now that i have um you know, uh, now for a long time now, I've had a three year old yeah, yeah. and now Maddie's eight in my life. I've been watching a lot of Disney movies. Mm -hmm. And when Inside Out came out, I mean, I thought the psychological wisdom inherent in that movie and the way they yeah. showed that the intrapsychic landscape, mm -hmm. right? That mm -hmm. different self parts in. And I love that they had uh, what's his name? Um, the actor um, Black um, Lewis uh, Black. What is it? Lewis Black play Lewis anger. Black. He was anger, right? He was ah, rah, rah, rah. perfect. Perfect. He's the only. He's, he's the only man to do it. Perfect. He was a perfect guy to be in that role. Well, they've just released this week, Encanto, mm -hmm. which is the new Disney movie, and it was all about perfectionism. I say the name and of I'm, the movie again. Encanto. E N C A N T O. Okay. In Canto. So it was about this, this family in Latin America, I believe it took place, um, or somewhere in South America. And they go through this hardship. And when they're on the brink of, of the darkest day in the world, all of a sudden this magic happens and it creates this incredible world for them to live in, right? Mm -hmm. And um, the one lady who's the grandmother, the the kind of the maternal um, leader of this whole family, right? Um, she unwittingly, and it was unintentional, it wasn't done out of any bad intention. And I really hope people can get that when they see the movie. She wanted things to be perfect. Mm -hmm. And she kept pressuring all of the children that were born to perfectly play their role in the family. Mm -hmm. And their roles were different things because each child in this family, when they became of age, they were granted a certain magical gift. Mm -hmm. Every child's gift was very, very, very special. But she had an idea of how that gift was ideally supposed to be manifested in the family. And the more pressure she put on them to be what she thought they should be, quote, unquote, the more the magic started to die. And now in this magical house, and this house was so cool. I mean, it did everything for you. I mean, it played with the kids. It, I mean, it, this house was so neat. I want to grow up in a house like that. <laughs> As the more and more pressure she put, the more and more cracks started. And at the heart of this thing was this magic candle. Mm -hmm. And the more and more pressure she put for people, the magic flame was dying more and more and more. To the point where it had to be completely deconstructed for them to discover how to get the magic back. It was phenomenal. So now you got to hear that part of it. How did they get the magic back? Well, I just want to say the writers have done some really good therapy, no doubt. <laughs> oh my! <laughs> whether God. they did that through that whether they did that through official therapy or just whatever personal growth, that's oh. somebody who understands personal growth. Well, and I'll tell you, and, and one of the one of the key figures in this movie was this was a member of the family called Bruno who had disappeared, and he really hadn't disappeared. He was just behind the walls in the house trying to keep up the image of perfection because he because the because he saw that that it was going to destroy the family if if that image wasn't kept up so he was behind the scenes trying to patch the cracks wow it, i mean it's so cool this movie is so cool so they go through this whole thing and the one person where this thing starts to change is the little girl that when she went up to the magic door to be given her her gift of magic mm -hmm. there was no gift of magic so she was normal she had no magic well it turned out bruno was behind the scenes of that because her magic gift was somehow to see beyond 
the perfection. Mm -hmm. And he couldn't let that exist. So he undermined her gift of her, her gift, her magical gift, thinking that that would keep this family intact, right? Mm -hmm. Well, it didn't, of course, because the disease process was already in play. The perfection mm -hmm. was eating away. The curse of perfection was destroying this family. And then this, through this little girl's courage, I mean, and it was so great. You know, the one person who was judged as a problem in this whole thing actually was the savior of this whole family. Always the truth teller, yeah. And always, she was the truth teller, man. Mm -hmm. And in the end, what brought the magic back was to celebrate each person as they were yeah. and who they were and not to put an expectation on them, but to enjoy them and, and celebrate them as they are. And as soon as they got that, guess what happened? The well, whole community the came together, built the house again, and the magic came back. Mm -hmm. Everybody <laughs> was who they were supposed to be, not supposed to be, but who they were instead right. of being who they were supposed to be. It was so frigging cool. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> well, the, the, the joy that Patrick and I get is, is not only just to hear you, then people can hear that in your voice, but to watch you tell the story. I think what we would have said today before I saw this movie is mm -hmm. one way to, to get rid of this curse of perfection is to realize what a big lie it is. Yeah. It doesn't exist. No. You were touching right. on that last week. It doesn't exist, but it's a myth. It's the biggest myth that that's been perpetuated because so much emphasis is put on everything being perfect, right? And everything being the, exactly the way it's supposed to be and stuff in our culture and the emphasis on the perfect performance. What do you want? All tens if you're a gymnast, you know, all of this mm -hmm. thing that somehow we see that is the ideal. You know, I've talked a few, several times with you, Alan, and some on the podcast about how, how much more uh, how much more I, I have appreciated my very first book, Simple Truth, since we started all this and realizing how amazing it is that so much of this is there. And on the, the very the very first cover, it was in the first edition of it. I what I remember I chose to put on the back cover it was one little nutshell, which was perfection. Perfection is not even one of our options. What a relief. Yeah. And, and it's like it's like I had many people look at me and say, say I don't think people are going to know what that means, but I just loved it. And, and it's like and, and I still do. And it's like and that's what you're describing here. It's like it's not it's not an option. It's and, and, and more. It's a it's a lie that's, that is, that it's a possibility. Um, yeah, it's it's um, when you we guys uh, could you guys delineate, you know, going off of what you're saying, um, <laughs> Cause you guys work hard on your um, on your craft and your practice and your books. Um, so how do you delineate from your drive to excel at uh, those endeavors and the oppressive perfectionism that would be unhealthy and kind of unravel those attempts? Well, first, first of all, first of all, the, the perfectionism, which is, which is ultimately, you know, and, and, uh, uh, takes, can take the form of my should monster Alan's, you know, anger, anger, uh, uh, that's not a dragon. What is that? That's a that's a dinosaur that you have that you use to represent. I love that. It's like you know, it's that it, it actually it actually works the exact opposite way. I mean that 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 uh, that belief that there's a possibility or us by you know way we say it if we're separating from if we're differentiating ourselves from the perfectionist voice, if we to the degree that we buy into it that we're supposed to be shooting for perfection. Um, and basically what that was for me always was no matter what it was, it wasn't good enough. You know, if, if, if it was this, then it should have been that. And if it was, if it was, if it was that, it should have been sooner or whatever. It was always the way. And what I, what I believe, one of the things I think is most important to believe and to actually, actually even maybe fake it till you make it is to know that, that that not only is not the, the best way to, to move forward, that's paralyzing. I think we talked about that a little bit last time too. That, was, that does the opposite. It stops you. It's, 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 it's understanding that, that whatever we're trying to do, whatever, whatever, version of success we want to have or what do we want to accomplish is going to come from trial and error, multi multiple failures. Uh, it's and that and we measure it to me, the most important thing to suggest to people that they're listening to the correct voice is, is that they're the, the uh, and I mean, the most effective voice that that's that authentic voice inside that says, are we what are we learning? Yeah. And if we're learning, then we're growing.
Yep. And if we're, you know, and if we're growing and, you know, and in my experience is, and I'll bet the same is true for you guys is very seldom has something, have I ever set out to, to, to create something. And when I got there, it turned out to be what I thought it was going to be anyway. Yeah. So part of it's being open to the bigger process and realizing, you know, that's that's I, I'm not even I'm not even in charge of what this is going to be. I, I'm going to go with it. The amazing mathematical formula for pain that when we are in our perfectionist stuff, we are asking we're buying into the idea of we are supposed to be doing accomplishing something on a daily basis that is beyond human capacity. And that's ultimate self victimization. And the difference between my expectation and my level of competence in any time, that's the mathematical formula. It's the only mathematical thing I know. The difference between my expectation, think of it as a graph of the, the expectation line and the, and the line of where I'm functioning today is the, the amount of pain I'm in. You know, and so what we what we teach people is is you bring that line of expectation. This is and this is so much emotional sobriety, Alan. This is, I, I had done, written this a long time ago. And when you're talking about expectation, I just go, oh, that's it. It's like you bring that line of expectation down closer, as close as you can to the line of your competence of today. That's determined by more variables than we can count. It's like and then the energy is freed up for us to get better. And to be able to be productive and to do what we need to do. It's, it's like the idea that we have to get our level of competence always up to our, our line of expectation is draining and painful. And, and it will, it will, it, it at least slows us down very often stops us in our tracks. And I have said this many, many times, and I'll just, you know, piggyback onto what you're saying, Tom, because I think that early on, that we came up with this idea uh, that of who we were supposed to be to be okay. Mm -hmm. And it just is exactly what you said. So we set this bar and that bar is set. It's an impossible goal. It's, it's, it's above it's a, there's, if there's a line of demarcation that says human capacity, it's above that. It's above that line in, and, and mm -hmm. what it is, it's, it's, it's what Bill called the imp an impossible way of life. Once I decided I have to be this person that it's in, inhuman to be, but I think I have to be it. I made that an absolute goal. And at the point that it became an absolute is where my perfectionism was born. Now I had to be this no matter what, in order to be okay, anything right. less or other than that was not okay. And then I hated myself for it. What you just also described is another from another angle. It's addiction. It's like it's like we become addicted to it. And that means we have that's to right. have it. We have to have it. We have to be that way. It's a compulsion. And that's exactly right. Addiction is is definitely riddled with compulsive behavior. This is a compulsive behavior. I must do this whether it's working or not, whether right. it's good for me or not. I must achieve this unrealistic goal. And I measure myself to that. And right. of course, right. I'm never going to be good enough. How can I ever feel good enough if what I'm setting up is mm -hmm. this unreal ideal, right? This idealized self that no one can be. But right. yet I think that's who I'm supposed to be. And at some point, I dedicated my life to actualizing that possibility, to actualizing right. that concept. My even God, though we, I'm even though we never get there, it's it's like that's. I mean, that, and I think we, I think we said this last time, but I don't think you can repeat this one enough. Is is because and and you've had these conversations with 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 people and clients before too. It's like a perfectionist is not somebody who does things perfectly. A perfectionist is someone who is tortured because they believe that they're supposed to do everything perfectly and that to do something perfectly is is right. is less is less than is less than okay it's like and the truth is you know as human beings our level of competence at anything whether we our level of confidence professionally as podcasters as therapists uh, but but as as friends to each other to as, as spouses and you know it's like our level of competence is is 
affected every single day of our lives by more variables than we can possibly count. It's like, how, what kind of weather is it? How did I get enough sleep? And my wife and I getting along, you know, did, you know, that, that, that damn cat pissed me off yesterday. You know, it doesn't matter. There's, there's minute little details and stuff. We don't, our job is not to track all that stuff, but to respect ourselves, to understand. And this is the, the specifically Patrick, when you were talking before we started, I think about, we were talking about the, the concrete, ways of dealing with perfectionism is like it's about it's about self-respect and understanding that you know we do not control all of those variables we we and this goes back to the theme we always have which is response ability the ability to respond we we respond to how we are in the moment and if i'm having a you know if i'm having a, a bad day because i'm tired if i'm i i, I always do, I call, do what i call surfing my depression even with medication it kind of comes in, in circles through D you know rather than fight that and tell myself there's something wrong with me because i'm in i can feel some of that depression it's like whatever i'm doing however i'm responding needs to incorporate that in how i'm dealing with myself so that i am responding with respect and compassion to ourselves I promise you, if you guys listening who have any of this going on, if you want to be challenged for the rest of your life, learn that. It's, I mean, I promise you, you'll be very busy. I'm, you know, I'm six, I'm six, almost 68 years old and, and still working hard on it, working on it on a regular basis. I, I don't mean that to be discouraging people because I'm much better at it than I used to understand much more about that, but it's a day to day process. And that's what we want to do is get to where we can master you know, treating ourselves with respect. I thought it was interesting in your book, Alan, how you referred to ideas of perfectionism as limited and self-centered. So in other yes. words, not that perfect, right? Right. That's right. Exactly. Well, look, look at, and let's just build on, on some of the stuff we're talking about already. And even what you just said, Patrick. So, you know, the way I was starting to think about it is, is that one of the reasons that the 12 steps work so effectively is step one really poisons this well of perfectionism. Yes. It says mm -hmm. your whole way, your all your ideas in terms of who you think you're supposed to be, how you think life is supposed to be, what you think you should be able to do and handle are going to be deconstructed. You're going to, first of all, admit you're powerless over alcohol. You've been trying to control that your whole life, right? Or mm -hmm. drugs, whatever, if it's your addiction. And then the second part is that your life has become unmanageable, that the whole way you've been approaching your life has created this unmanageability. So talk about a one-two punch, right? Right. Not right. only uh, is it powerless here, but the whole way that you're approaching this thing isn't going to work. That moment, see, that moment of getting that, you know what? It's the problem, and I love how it's so simply stated in the big book. We come to the realization that our problems of our are of our own making. Yeah. I mean, it's that simple line. Wow. So I've created my existence. Fritz Perls would say, yes, you have, Alan. Mm -hmm. You've mm -hmm. created your existence. You create your symptoms. You produce this whole deal that you're struggling with. Now, that sounds like bad news at first, but like you said, Tom, it's also empowering because if I take responsibility for that, it means I can also be, I have the ability to respond to find another way of being in the world that works a lot better. Mm -hmm. And to me, that's the gift of emotional sobriety that we're talking about. Absolutely. I mean, the, the thing that probably the line I repeat most with 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 clients, I think, is everything is information. So that means, you know, that's you know, that is that is that is a uh, I think the technical term for that is on the when you really are able to absorb and take in and accept that first step. Yeah, uh, that is, yeah, I think it's called a shitload of information. That's, yeah. that's the term for it. It's like, it's a lot and it's, and it's a lot to process. And, 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 it, and it gives us compassion for people who dig their unconsciously dig their heels in when they, when they start to, to look at that 12 step programs. And I'm not saying 12 step programs are the, the right thing for everybody because it I'm, you know, doesn't have to be, but, but whatever, whatever, whatever process you're going to go through, it's going to, it's going to include that humility on the front end that Alan is describing that the first right. step, does, the well, first step, I, in I, our opinion, way, to, just, way to build that at the time it's right on it's a shitload of information. Bill mm -hmm. says every instinct cries out against accepting our personal powerlessness. 
Right. Every instinct cries out against it. And the reason is, is the way I would say it from, from as a psychologist, my false self is going crazy that I'm even considering this because it means giving up the solution that I thought was the answer. Yeah. It, it means surrendering this, what I've dedicated my whole life to creating. And so it is a tall order, right? What an order. I can't go through with it. It's a tall order for us to have to do that. But it is so important to, I, I like this one author talks about the crack in the cosmic egg. It's so <laughs> important to let that crack and the cracks in the Encanto and the magic mm-hmm. house that was built. Yeah. Literal important cracks there. Yeah. Those cracks happen, man, and follow them. Now, I wanted to suggest a few exercises for people listening today. Because this is back to the paradoxical nature of change. Sometimes we change these things, not by trying to become something we're not, just all of a sudden automatically accepting, okay, I'm not perfect. We can say those. Those words are easy to say. But to live them, it becomes another thing. My path to starting to get a hold of this stuff was to go the other way, is to sit down and give myself permission to be as outrageous as possible, meaning to sit down and declare and demand how I'm supposed to be perfect and to just give voice to every one of those parts of my person that are that are demanding that. I, I, I need to be perfect this way. I need to be perfect like that. If I'm perfect, this is what's going to happen is to really, really take that voice that's inside of us and let it have free reign. And as you're being that to listen to it, listen to it. Yeah. You're we'll call that hear yourself out. You know, it's like sit down and say, okay, everybody who wants to come, all the committee, everybody who has an objection to this, come in. We're here to listen. That's right. That's right. And we're going to start with, I love that. You know, I must be perfect. You know, I must be perfect Mm -hmm. this way. You know, being perfect means, I mean, all these kinds of things, do some sentence completion work around this. Mm -hmm. Being Mm -hmm. perfect means, you know, I Mm -hmm. must be perfect because, you know, Mm -hmm. if I was perfect, I would finish that Mm -hmm. sentence. I mean, Mm -hmm. you know, create a few of your own. You know, yeah, go the, go the other way. Be, go with if, if I if I if I fail at being if I fail at perfecting fail at this, perfect. then yeah. then you're going to go right to your, per, your your biggest fears. It's like absolutely go, go after all of this stuff mm-hmm. and write it down, put it down on a paper, because that's the other thing that happens. Not just listening to yourself do it. But when you write it down, you can even be a little more objective about it and start to mm-hmm. see it. When mm-hmm. I did this and I let myself I gave myself permission to be. What, what I called outrageous because I felt a lot of these things, but I was a closet perfectionist. I didn't want anybody to know about it. I didn't right. want you to. Because I would that. think less of you, right? Right. 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 I knew that that was wrong. I mean, part of being perfect was to be perfect and not right. let anybody know about it. I mean, it was, That's right. it was this crazy idea that I had. But give yourself permission to do this because as soon as you you see it, an amazing change is going to happen. Mm-hmm. Now the other parts of you have an ability to come in and, and have something to say about this. And the part of you that's maybe even compassionate towards you, you know, because what does this all come back to? Acceptance. Mm-hmm. We talk about acceptance is the key over and over and over again. The change in that movie in Canto happened the minute people accepted themselves as they were and the grandmother accepted everybody as being just exactly who they were and not to have any expectation to be something else. It yeah. was that moment that that happened in the movie that the magic came back. Mm-hmm. All, and, and we repeat this a lot. All change begins with acceptance. That's something yeah. that I don't think I don't think I, I don't know that I I don't know if I didn't know that before, but I certainly didn't know that sentence before I, that, that I, I was talking with you and specifically also with Roger on Thursday night. It's like like and and as his in his work with Nathaniel Brandon, it's like like uh, all change begins with acceptance has really it's, it's really a, a perception, a perspective changer for me. It has been. Uh, it's one of one of if I had to list the top five things, I think that I have really 
seen differently from a different angle. Well, as we've been doing the emotional sobriety thing through on the Thursday group and through the podcast, it would be, that's, that's one of the, the top five. Definitely. It's like, and, and like you, even acceptance goes to this thing of accepting. First of all, that you are demanding yourself to be perfect. See, it even mm-hmm. works that way. You accept that. Then it opens the door to accept yourself as you are. I mean, this is, this is the, the mystery and the magic of recovery, because it's magical what happens here. It really is. What you just said, but let's go back to something you just said, because it's so important that when you're practicing acceptance, part of that acceptance is going to include the full acceptance that you are demanding these this these unrealistic things of yourself that that we have compassion for that as well because see that's there's always that part of us that wants to come or for me anyway there's always that part that wants to come in and make something wrong about something bad about me something wrong in a really negative way and so so then i could beat myself up for trying to you know but for for demanding perfection it's like but what you do is you take it that that additional level into it farther down to full acceptance which is oh yeah that guy over there yeah he demands that I be perfect, you know, yeah. you know, yeah, that's right. He, he, he's sitting over there by the guy that thinks I have to drink tequila all the time. It's like, you know, they, 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 oh, they think that friends. Shit. Those two they're guys good, are really good friends, oh. by the way. They are so good friends. I mean, they're, they're, every time I've cop, written bad cop. Yeah, no, every time I've written down uh, my perfectionist demands, they're just ridiculous, preposterous. It's like if I saw somebody else write that, I would uh, chastise them for being so hard, <laughs> hard on themselves, you know? Right. right. Well, and then we do it to ourselves all the time. And and, yeah. and see, that's what happens with this stuff is that it's we do become habituated. It means we don't even experience what it means because we're so used to doing it to ourselves. Right. It becomes so automatic, these things. And, you know, if nothing else, I hope that you hear – when we're doing these shows or even on Thursday night, it's pause and take a look at what you're doing in your life. Really just mm-hmm. pause and try to get honest with yourself because that's where this stuff starts to change. Now, you know, it's funny you were saying this, you know, next week um, we're going to be, rec- you know, I was going to talk to you guys about recording on a different day because on Sunday I'm doing that the 10 days of George Washington's campaign. Oh, starting yeah. With- you know, starting with crossing the Delaware on Christmas Day to attack the the uh, German mercenaries, the Hessians in um, Trenton, New Jersey. Mm-hmm. And then the 10 days of the campaign that followed that, that really were the pivotal point of the Revolutionary War. That's what, you know, gave birth to our country, you know, as we know it today. Mm-hmm. What's very interesting is I'm digging into this history is that one of the turning points in Washington's a way of approaching this is he had to accept that dealing with an army that's coming from people committed to freedom is very different than governing an army where everybody falls in line because they're they're supposed to fall in line and follow the orders. Mm -hmm. And that when you're dealing with volunteers like he was dealing with and not professional soldiers, they're there because they want to be there and they want to have a voice in this whole thing. And you can't just command them and say, you will do this because I'm telling you to do this. There has to be a respect for their individuality, Mm -hmm. which the British soldiers didn't have. The German mercenaries didn't have. They were told what to do by the commanders and they listened. And in the American army, it was an equal thing. Yes, we had we had people that were leading us, but we had a say in what they were doing, too, and what, what we thought was the right thing. It's such an interesting thing is that as he accepted that this is the way it was instead of how he thought it was supposed to be, he became a better leader. Just fascinating how acceptance is so powerful right in any area of our life and in in our history in our personal histories even in the disney movie and canto so if you Mm -hmm. another recommendation i'm recommending Mm -hmm. movies i recommend Mm -hmm. coda you know the movie children of deaf adults also Mm -hmm. coda the sign and music it's an incredible Mm -hmm. independent film that may win best film this year watch it it's powerful it'll give you a peek into five family dynamics and now go see encanto 
even if you don't have kids. So does that mean uh, when we next gather, uh, we'll be talking about forgiveness? Because that's the subject of the chapter uh, next in your book. Well, I think that'll be fitting for us to do that. And, and if we and forget, I think we can forgive ourselves. Yes, that's right. Thank you for the movie description. It was it was my favorite, favorite part uh, right after the part that you actually personally knew your turkey. <laughs> <laughs> Tinge your life. Tinge your myth. Cultivate your narrative with whomever you're with. Then with glass in hand and children on one knee. Bring some stories. Bring your stories back to me. It ain't a crime to be a human Never be ashamed to be yourself Rest assured that whatever you're doing Will entertain me like nobody else So here's to us, my old friends Until it's time to drink the wine and break the bread again With glass in hand and children on one knee Bring some stories, bring your stories back to me.